Good day and welcome to HMI's podcast. Today we have the pleasure of speaking with Mr. Yves Juvel, Corporate HR Director for International Operations for Hyatt Hotels and Resorts. Hi Yves, lovely to have you back with us. Thank you very much, Anthony. Let's talk about job interviews. Mm. I mean, you've missed over your years, you've interviewed hundreds of people. What would you say are the do's and the don'ts when attending a job interview? I think the first thing, don't come late. I think that's one of the big ones. Uh, I think you only have one chance to create a good impression, a first impression. Um, so definitely I think there's, there's a concept which is called aesthetical skills. And aesthetical skills is not about if somebody is good looking or not good looking. Aesthetical skills is how you present yourself, uh, uh, what you do with what you have. Uh, it is your professional attire, your grooming, your body language, the way you present yourself. Uh, I think this is again something which is very important. Um, a couple of don'ts as well in, in, in the first interview would be salary. Mm -hmm. I think uh, personally I feel it is inappropriate in a first interview when somebody is talking salary. I think that's something that will come at the, f at the later stage. But on the other side I think it's important that uh, an interviewee asks questions. Uh, because a lot of interviewers, they want that. They want to see, you know, how interested is that candidate. Mm -hmm. um, make sure you have researched the organization. Again, these days, with access to internet, uh, this is always going to be one of the questions. What do you know about the company? You know, have you checked out our website? Uh, why do you want to join our organization? What kind of philosophy do we have and why do you think you can identify yourself with our organization? So again, these do's and don'ts, some of them are fairly logical. But I think one should just not forget them. Be prepared, research the organization, come on time, present yourself well, be yourself. Uh, don't try to be somebody you're not, uh, because a good interviewer is definitely going to catch you out. Right? All right. I mean, it's really interesting, and I'm glad you mentioned the point about researching the company. Um, for the different levels of a position, are there any maybe additional points that a graduate or someone applying for a management position should be aware of or should know within that company? Well, I think that they should just know about it because, again, um, I think at the moment we're still in an employer's market. I think a couple of years ago, most graduates had two or three job opportunities. Mm -hmm. At the moment, uh, it's the other way around. Uh, so I think every graduate has to sell him or herself to the best abilities. And I think knowing the organization, being able to discuss the organization you're applying for during the interview is, uh, is very much a, a plus. And I think that's whether it's a management position or an entry position makes no difference. Again, everybody has access to the internet. Uh, they can read about the organization. They know where the hotels are. Uh, that's definitely something. I think the second thing is that students have to apply with organizations where they can identify themselves with. So if they say, fine, I only want to work in Germany, or I only want to work in China, then maybe an international organization is not the best fit. Then they should mm -hmm. be looking for a local organization. Whereas if they apply for an international organization, they have to show some more flexibility. Yes, I want to go there. I can do that. So I think it's also a, a match uh, looking at what is the organization, what does it stand for, and what are you looking for. Because if there is a mismatch, again, the recruiter will pick mm -hmm. it up. I want to ask you a question about, you mentioned about dress code. Mm -hmm. um, I once heard from another HR director that one should do research and find out what is the dress style or the color of you know, employees working for a specific hotel mm -hmm. and then dress accordingly. Mm -hmm. so in your opinion, would you agree with that or is there a certain color one should definitely wear? I think it comes down a little bit to, there's a concept called emotional intelligence. And emotional intelligence is all about knowing your own emotions and how can you use your emotions to influence other people, for example. And one of the principles there would be mirroring as well. So probably when you say, fine, I'm applying in an organization which is very corporate, uh, where the uniforms in the lobby as you walk through are black and white and the manager wearing gray suits, uh, you're probably not going to point yourself in a red suit. Mm. So I think, yes, I think you can dress appropriately, but there are some very basic rules to professional attire. And I think if somebody has a darker color suit, whether it is blue or gray or black, anthracite or whatever, 
with a white shirt, even if it has some, some colors in it, uh, you have a safe bet. And I would, you know, I, th I think if you go and apply with Google or with Apple, you're going to dress differently than we're going to apply for a corporate hotel chain. Right. So probably looking the part uh, might be different depending on the company you apply with. Right. It's interesting you mentioned the white shirt. Mm. Is that a, a must? No. I think it's, I, I mean more like, for example, going with a black shirt uh, might be less appropriate mm -hmm. uh, than having a lighter shirt, uh, especially if you wear a tie. Mm. But then, again, it depends. I mean, if you go and apply with... Uh, a champagne company, you might dress differently than yeah. if you go and apply with, uh, with a hotel company or if you go and apply with, e even within hotels, uh, somebody who wants to work in a resort property was probably dressed differently than somebody who goes with a corporate city property. Mm -hmm. But I think it's just, you make the first impression. A recruiter is looking for something. So probably if you're smart enough to dress accordingly, you already get yourself a couple of points ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, for the gents, it's easy, you know, a suit, you wear long pants and a mm. jacket. Mm. What about the ladies? I mean, definitely they wear a business suit. Mm. But what is more acceptable? Would it be a pants, a pants suit, or a business suit with a skirt? It all goes back to aesthetical skills again. Because again, certain shapes wear different clothing. Mm. And I think it's all about where do you feel yourself best in? Mm -hmm. Because again, if you're not comfortable with what you wear, then whatever you're dressing is not going to help you. Yeah. So I think it has to be comfortable, it has to look professional. Whether it's pants or skirts is not really important. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about resumes. Mm -hmm. I mean, how would a graduate prepare a resume? I mean, every country has different laws. In the US, mm -hmm. they say don't put on your date of birth in a, po in a, a photo. So from your experience having worked all over the world, what are the important do's and don'ts in a resume? I think sometimes you have to look at who is going to read your resume. I think preparing a resume is sort of bound to local laws quite often, like you said in the States. You wouldn't put photos, you wouldn't put, you go to a degree where the date of birth doesn't go on, you're not going to put dates on education. Um, again, it all has to do in certain countries with equal opportunities. Uh, but the resume is here to sell yourself. And I think a young student, uh, should put whatever he or she is comfortable with. Uh, if you want to put a photo, you put a photo. If you want to put your date of birth, you put your date of birth. Uh, again, I think a, a CV can be as complete or as basic as you want it to be. In some countries, uh, a basic resume is perfectly acceptable. In other countries, they would like to have some more information. So maybe you have to look at the audience. Who is going to be the reader of my resume? What am I comfortable putting in my resume? And then putting this together. Um, somebody asked me this morning, what do you do with a resume? And I said, I don't necessarily always read the resume, but I'd like to read what's not in the resume. It's always very interesting going through a resume and sort of trying to find out what is missing. And I think a resume can be as creative or as basic as you want it to be, uh, but you should somehow reflect who you are in your resume. Making it too factual is going to make it very difficult for a recruiter, and you're not going to stand out making it too creative uh, doesn't make it look professional. Mm -hmm. So you have to find the right balance of bringing some of your personality in your, in your resume. Don't overload it, stay to the facts, uh, but make it your resume. So that's some mm -hmm. of the tips. Many people have a question, you know, it's two questions. Is references important in a resume? And what is, you know, what is considered too many references or too few references? Hmm. There's, there's two lines of thoughts here. Myself, I'd never call a reference because nobody puts a bad reference on a resume. No. So I think a reference, if somebody tells me find references up in requests, uh, then it's perfectly acceptable. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe for a graduate, uh, why not if they had somebody they were quite close with in the school? But I think the essence of reference checking is not necessarily calling up the reference on the paper. It's calling up somebody else who's going to tell me something about the candidate. So I think references for me is not a must, uh, but they have to be available in case we ask right. for it. Uh. Let's go to the cover letter. Many people say that's the first thing a recruiter looks at. Mm. And if you don't sell yourself within that cover letter, you know, they're not even going to go to the second page which is mm. the start of your resume. Mm. Again, what are the important elements in that cover letter mm. that says to someone, you know, 
please read my resume. Mm. I mean, you said, you said go to the second page. I mean, today with online recruitment, there is no more second page. Uh, somebody applies for a job, you're asked to upload your resume, and a very big percentage of students or applicants in general don't even upload a letter anymore. Now, the question comes with online recruitment, do we even need a letter? I would say in general, you don't need a letter. But if you have a good letter, it's definitely going to score you some points. So again, it's probably not accepted that everybody has to put a letter, but I think a good letter makes sense. Now, a good letter can give me some additional information about the candidate. You know, why are you applying with us? What would you like to do? You know, where do you see your strengths and how can you apply them with us? So I don't need a three-page letter telling me everything they've done since kindergarten, but maybe a couple of things, you know, this is why I would like to join your company, um, this is what I have done, and this is how I can use my skills uh, in the context of your organization. This is the place I'd like to work in, in this kind of function. Staying flexible enough. They mm -hmm. don't have to tell me that I want to be a receptionist, but they can tell me, you know, I'd like to broaden my horizons in rooms division, something like that. So it has to be pragmatic, readable, and no mistakes. I mean, I say no mistakes. Uh, I think it's a small thing to research who you're sending the letter to. And I can tell you, I had some very interesting letters. I've been called Mrs. Givelle. I've been the VPH of for Hilton, for Sheraton, for whatever company. And I think it's a small thing to, to just look at your letter before you send it off. Quite often, students put the last sentence, you know, I'm looking forward to meeting a representative of. Make sure you put the same company as you mentioned at the beginning. So don't address your letter to the Hyatt and then look forward to meeting with somebody from Fairmont. Like I said, I'm getting 10 letters a day like this. Now it's fascinating you mention that. Mm. What do you do with that? Do you dis disregard it, put it in um, what we call file 13, the dustbin? Depends how hard I feel about it and yeah. whether I actually want to meet the student. Yeah. Depends. I think if you're, honestly speaking, if we're talking about a management training application, and somebody is not capable of proofreading his application letter, I wonder whether this person should be considered for that kind of opportunity. Now, I wouldn't close the door to a candidate like that, but probably I would say, you know, maybe not for a management training. If the candidate mm -hmm. wants to apply for something else, that's absolutely fine, but maybe for our top program, I would probably say maybe not. Okay, just last, let, uh, last, last question about the cover letter. Um, would you say it's important that one is selling their strengths, but also making that letter very unique to the position they're applying for? You know, not the, the same standard cover mm. letter that they use to apply for 10 jobs. Mm. Well, I think it ha there has to be some uniqueness in it. Uh, I think the reality is that today's students will have to apply to 20, 30 jobs, and creating 30 letters is very difficult. Uh, but I think uh, today with word processing and everything, you can still bring a little uniqueness in there in mm. terms of the organization you're applying with and the kind of position you're applying with. Uh, so I would say make it as unique as you can, but of course keeping a balance that you can't write mm -hmm. 30 different letters. <laughs>